Well, I declare. <laughs> I do this every day in a different church, and they're all different. Last thing I want to do in my lifetime, contribute to the ministry, is uh, standardize the microphone. Good to be with you this morning. I turn to Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Probably most of you don't need to turn there, but I thought I would just give you my text. And I want to say to you this morning, I'm, I'm going to not preach the negative part of this message. I'm going to skip to the positive because I want you to see what the benefits of revival are and perhaps we'll be motivated to then look back and see what the prerequisites are and we'll be willing to pay the price for revival. Now, I, I hope that I'm just in my old age and uh, uh, kind of don't have it all together, but I am uh, very much concerned about our nation and the dangers that we face and the people that we're our young men and women that we have overseas and I'm not uh, I'm not depending on the mighty armed forces that we have and the modern technology of warfare that we have because in this verse I'm going to read I think uh, what God says nullifies that. Let me read it, verse 13, Second Chronicles 7, 13. If I, God speaking, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, whatever God permits, he's sending it. And he sends it not because he doesn't love us, but to correct us. And uh, maybe I'm an alarmist, but uh, I've been saved 40 years and I've... Uh, I'm distressed at what I see and uh, I don't have a message on uh, the evil of abortion or homosexuality or drunkenness or drugs or casinos uh, because uh, I think we need to narrow down to the engine. If the engine's broke, uh, I don't think we need to worry so much about the windshield wipers. And God says, if my people, that's the engine, us. So if he sends it, it's because of us. And if he spares us, it'll be because of us. And I travel the country, and I observe, and I'm distressed at uh, what I see in our churches and the direction we're going and I wonder if we have a clear conscience of sending our sons and daughters into face the enemy based on our spiritual condition. And if, if we don't have a clear conscience, what are we going to do about it? Just crank up the band again? Just have another covered dish, dinner on the ground, and all day singing? I'm, I'm concerned about, he says, if you turn from your wicked ways. Wicked ways, I thought about that. I thought uh, either we turn or God's going to turn. For the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. 
Now, I think that's specifically more than any other nation in existence today pertains to us because this has been a godly nation founded on biblical principles. Our laws, our money, everything declares our faith and commitment to God. We knew God. There are some nations that haven't known God. They don't seem to be included in this. Shall be turned into hell. Well, I just want to say a, a brief uh, thing about uh, that'll be negative, and that is about wickedness. Uh, I've, I've read some things recently that have uh, caught my attention. I've looked back through my sermon notes and don't have much or anything on it, never preached a message on it, and I'm not going to uh, this morning. But uh, worldliness, the seriousness of worldliness, now, in James chapter 4, the Bible says, verse 2, You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not... And I suggest to you that perhaps this adulterers and adulteresses not only includes the act of sexual immorality, but the adultery with the world that we have committed spiritually. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, dare we... Uh, Consider, are we enemies of God? I'm talking about us. Friendship with the world. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, I've never heard anybody alarmed about that. And it seems pretty serious, isn't it? To be a friend of the world, to be an enemy of God. I mean, I tithe and give and pray some and preach. And, you know, haven't killed anybody yet. And... Uh, but uh, an enemy of God. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Is that serious? Is that wicked? And I think, I've been thinking this morning, I've been riding to get here this morning, and, and I've been thinking about things that I know of, of good people, my brethren who... Uh, are in church, and I mean they're active in church, and some hold leadership positions. And uh, I wonder if it, if, if we've just let worldliness come in, and and we don't notice it, or redefined it, or you know, help me with this. What what uh, I know. Uh, every Sunday that I'm in my church, I see a young lady sitting. Alone, She has three beautiful daughters. They were saved. Her and her husband were saved in a church I pastored uh, 25 years ago. I was their pastor a few years, and their daughters were born, and uh, they were uh, saved, and baptized. And I came in one morning, and here she's sitting alone. Here sits the man over here on the other side with the three daughters. And he, uh, I talked to him after the service. He just came to me. He was looking for me. I'd been out of town. He said, I'm glad to see you. And he was weeping. He said that his wife had uh, been on the Internet, met some man, 
met him, met him for a weekend, she found out, divorced him, had an airplane ticket after court was over, already had it scheduled. She flew to South Carolina to do but with him. Now this man is a godly man. He's an athletic man, plays basketball, comes from the family of, of athletes, and, and he's a hard worker, provides for his family. She's never had to work outside the home. And uh, this man that she met is 53 years old, older than her, weighs over 300 pounds, and he saw a letter that he wrote to her, and he was illiterate. And she left her husband. and family. Now, she's not the only one in my church. And I've preached in some of your churches, and people would come to me and say, pray with my wife. She's, and I said, well, we'll, maybe we'll visit. Well, she's sitting back there. She's a Sunday school teacher. The church isn't doing anything about these things. Is that worldliness? Have we just ushered worldliness in? I know a deacon who is in leadership position in every service. If you met him, you'd love him. He does breast implants for women in the church. He's a plastic surgeon. Is that alarming? I mean, is, is that what we accept? Now, he's not just sitting on the pew, coming every now and then. Leadership. I attended, uh, we had a, something in our church, and they invited, uh, they had a newlyweds uh, game, and so they told us, come on over, it'd be a lot of fun. So my wife and I went over there. Of course, we didn't qualify, of course, but they had people, you know, and they did it. And uh, it was in our old church building, and... Uh, wasn't very long till it got outright raunchy. We, uh, I recently preached in a uh, eleven churches up North Mississippi on a discipleship training, and uh, so I got there, and before I knew it. In my introduction, before I got into the message, I started thinking about on the way, and I said, you folks who are doing discipleship training are, you have a very difficult task ahead of you because uh, just take this scenario. Suppose someone in your church got saved last Sunday. Maybe he and his wife is we were at the time when I got saved. Uh, my home was broken. We needed God. No hope except for God. And we got saved. We came to church and we were excited and we never missed a service. I mean, we got in there with all four feet and, and just uh, we were excited about what God had done and what he was doing. And, I, I, and things were different then. But... Uh, we, uh, I remember I was under conviction. I took my cigarettes out before I went to church that night when I got baptized. I didn't want them cigarettes wet. But uh, that's real conviction, isn't it? But I, in two weeks, I, I got under conviction about tithing because I thought tithing for two weeks before it ever come time, before I ever heard a sermon on it. I told my wife that they expected this. I called it T. It was spelled. I said, I, I didn't know what it was. I read it in the Bible, T-I-T-H-E. I said, I think it's pronounced T. And uh, we're going to have to do it. So we need to go to the base. I was in the Air Force. And I said, you know, they serve, uh, they give us free medical care because we don't make as much as civilians. And they give us uh, uh, commissary privilege. We buy food cheaper and PX and 
So she said, what are you driving at? And I said, well, they also have chapels. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, we can go and don't have to give anything. <laughs> you know, it's all paid for. That's because... So, uh, that's pretty good thinking. You stop to think about it. I mean, that was, that's the benefits. So, uh, I mean, they're paying a chaplain there, you know. So my wife, uh, she was a little less spiritual, I guess, at the time. And she said, well, if we ought to do it, let's do it. <laughs> so, uh, tie, that is. So, uh, I got into conviction about spending, so I started thinking that's what we really ought to do. And uh, I got to thinking, well, I'm spending $8 a month on these cigarettes, so I forfeit that. So I went in there, she was cooking, went in there and laid the cigarette. I said, well, I'm going to do that. We'll start doing it. We'll keep going to that church we've been going to and all that. And, and she said, well, I'll do your uniforms and everything. And so, so we started tithing. And I said, but suppose this guy gets saved yesterday. It, I was there on Monday night. And so, now you're, you're going to get him and you're going to teach him discipleship. But he's already had some heavy lessons on discipleship. He comes in Sunday night and the first discipleship training lesson he gets is on faithful attendance to the church. And he looks around, about a third of the people are there. So, lesson number one, not important to go to church. Am I on target? Hmm? And then he looks around, and everybody's casual. Now, by casual, he sees some wearing shorts. He sees women look like they're going to a bull ride after the church service, dressed like men. Huh? You know, I mean, all this is discipleship. How does a Christian dress? You know, how do we reverence God's house? Getting quiet in here. Is this working? <laughs> and then uh, they come to the song service, and the cheerleader gets up there. I mean, song leader. And... Uh, here we go, you know. And it has the same beat to it that he heard in the beer joint he was in before he got saved. Now, I'm just generalizing. I know all, but, but I, and I'm just describing us. I'm not talking about them. They're not here. Uh, and uh, so then the preacher gets up and starts to preach and he reads a text, and he begins to change the words. It don't mean this. Uh, this was better translated this. And so suddenly he don't believe he has a Bible. Well, nobody does, do they? I'm just telling you the problem. I don't have solutions. I'm leaving. <laughs> you know. But I'm wondering about worldliness. Have we let worldliness... You know, and he, uh, he, the pastor reads over there in uh, Genesis about Eliezer going to get a bride for Isaac. And uh, Eliezer puts a nose ring on her nose, according to his Bible he's reading from. Yeah. Next revision, it'll be a belly button hole too, you know. I mean, you know, one in the belly button. Are we just conformed to the image of this world? Are we walking according to the course of this world? That's what Ephesians 2, 2 says. We did before we got saved. So, I mean, I'm, is worldliness to be an enemy with God? And what is worldliness? What is it? I mean, what more could we bring in to qualify to be worldly? Well, I wish I hadn't asked that because I'll probably see it in my next assignment. But uh, the discipleship training that we get, no wonder we aren't growing Christians because we don't 
we're, we're, we're conformed to the image of this world. Be not conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I don't want to make a big things out of things that I've alluded to here, but I'm just simply saying, where is the limit? What's the church going to do? Let's just see what the world's doing, and that's where we'll be in the two or three years. I was telling the preacher here, I'm 70 years old, I founded a Christian school, a boy's home, a children's home. And uh, in that time, I studied and prayed and wept trying to find all I could find out from the Word of God about youth and, and how to do something with them and for them. And, and uh, so I've, uh, uh, when I was younger, I'd preach at youth camps and uh, preach to, uh, you know, when I'd go to... Uh, to church uh, to preach on Sunday morning. Uh, the pastor would get the youth in with the, the uh, adult Sunday school class and ask me to preach to them. I mean, you know, I just got one price. It covers everything. You know, I mean, you can work me. I'll cut, mow the lawn while I'm there. Just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. You know, I'd rather be teaching than listening to somebody else. I guess every preacher would. Amen. I mean, that's not pride. That's just the truth. <laughs> But anymore, they get some guy, you know, with sticky hair up there, 21 years old, you know, to teach the youth. I'm just saying, folks, we, we want entertainment for our youth. We want a young, hippie kind of fella that, I mean, you know, is personable and good-looking and athletic and, uh, you know, I mean, we, 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 we've just conformed. I see it just a lot of it. I mean, you know, I, I was in a meeting. A fellow introduced his youth director, stood up, had a big old chain, dog chain, dragged the floor, wearing sandals in the church house, you know. I mean, and uh, just, uh, you know, I mean, you can tell, hey, they, and this is one of the biggest churches in Houston. So uh, worldliness, what does it mean? It, it, does it, is it really an enemy of God? I mean, is it? If it is, are we fit to send our children to war? I mean, if we're sitting here God's people and we've become enemies, are in any way near qualification for that? Do you have a good conscience about this? I don't feel good about it. You say, well, it's not us. It's the... It's the... Uh, it's the uh, homosexuals and abortionists. No, we've been riding that too long. The reason we have all of that's because of us. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. See, what's encouraging about this, the answer is right here in this place. It's us. We don't have to convince the casino owners and all of that you know, we've been trying to work on them, trying to send money to politicians and get one in there that's going to take care of all that. And that's not the answer. The answer is us. Praise God. We can do something. But we must turn. Now, God says, uh, if you'll do that, he, he says he'll do these things. He'll hear from heaven. That means we can get prayers answered. That suggests that maybe, Brother Jimmy, that's why we can't many, get many people to pray. Because if they're not getting answered, you're not going to pray long, especially when nobody's looking. Now, you know, and I don't blame you. If God don't ever answer, give it up. You know, at least get some exercise. It profiteth little, but prayer with nobody listening profiteth nothing. So we need to look forward to this. We could get prayers answered. That's good. Well, what does that mean briefly? It means that uh, if, if we could get prayers answered, 
that uh, God would hear our prayer and uh, we would uh, have some things happening in our life. And when things are happening, you don't have to beg people to come to church. I've been in churches where God was working and people came and you had to build bigger buildings because God was there. People don't want to come and hear a good sermon. They want to see God. They want to see the intervention of God and that's what we owe. As a Christian, we owe that to our neighbors. If they don't see God intervening in our life, and we can't equate our life to God's working in our life, then there's something wrong. And we have no testimony. If we would hear from heaven, why don't we hear from heaven? Well, Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Regard, I looked up that word, studied that, and, and here's what it says. Regard means to keep, to guard, to defend. Does that sound like sin? I mean, we determine we're going to keep this sin, we're going to redefine it, not going to listen to what that preacher says. He's a legalist. He's a Pharisee. I'm going to start a study. I think you can put legalist and Pharisee on uh, the extinct species list. They're not endangered, they're gone. I'd give anything to meet a good Pharisee. I mean, he does some things Jesus said these y'all to done. He just got on him what the big things he left undone. I'd like to meet me a legalist. Wouldn't you? I mean, somebody just believes the law means something. I haven't seen one year. I mean, really, you know one, introduce him to me. I mean, I mean a biblical Pharisee. The more I read about them, the more I like them. Now, I know they got a fault, but I'm afraid most of us have, don't have the good parts going for us. I mean, just look at it. Boy, they tied. Do what they ought to do. They're sincere. They attend the meetings. They stand long. They stand up. They, they, just, just, they just miss some things, very important things that I'm not skipping over. But I'm simply saying, I don't know one. You know one, I'd like to see him. I want his autograph. Not that I'm approving of him. I'd just like to see one that's at least trying. Wouldn't you? You know anybody trying? I mean, just really sincere about it. We guard our sin. We defend it. We're not going to give it up. And you won't hear from heaven. No prayers answered. If you have a higher regard, higher value on your sin than you do a relationship with God, then you'll never hear from heaven. I remember one time a lady came forward for salvation and someone dealt with them. And after the service, my wife and I would meet with the people who trusted the Lord that morning, talk to them, and we talked to this lady and asked where she lived and all that. Come to find out she was living with a man, not married. So uh, we talked to her about that and uh, said, well, you know, you can't do that. Uh, that's, that's over, you know, not over tomorrow it's over today you know rich young ruler say all what you have you know whatever your sin is if you have a higher regard for that than you'd have for the relationship with God then you're you're out of it whatever it is that's what the Bible says and so uh, and God forgives if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness but we defend it deny it is sin hold on to it disobedience and so uh, she after the conversation she said well uh, she wasn't ready to do that I said well now don't tell anybody you got saved today because you didn't that's God's plan of salvation God puts his finger on your sin. 
If it's because of your wealth, sell all you have, give to the poor, and follow me. He said, no, I think I'll just go on down the road. That's what we ought to tell a lot of people. Amen. I'm, I'm, you don't give up everything, but I knew when I got saved, I had to give up alcohol. That's what God put his finger on. Oh, there was all kinds of things, but I knew that had to go. As long as I held on to the alcohol, there was no salvation, you see. When I came to that place, and I said, God, I can't give it up, but I want to. I, I'm sick of myself. God saved me. He saved me. We'll get prayers answered. We'll also have sin forgiven. Guilt of sin. I'll tell you the truth. So many folks today, and I've done a lot of counseling. Not everybody. I'm not trying. I'm just simply saying this. I got a brief time. But a lot of people today, you'd get well if you'd get right. You're taking pills and you need the gospel. You got an appointment with a doctor and you need an appointment with his altar. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Bible says if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But if we don't judge ourselves, we'll be chastened of the Lord. that will not be condemned with the world. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and some sleep. Now, you just think about that study. Many are sick, weak, and some die. Why? Because you won't judge yourself. You've got a worldly view of Christianity that maybe you got from the seminary you attended or whatever. But, but you, you just, uh, you stay that right where you are. You're not willing to examine yourself. Not in line of Scripture, not in line of what I think. I'm talking about what God says. Examine yourself. That's a great opportunity. That's a positive sermon. It doesn't make any difference whether you believe what I preach or not. You're not going to, uh, nothing's going to change until you get a hold of what God says. It's not me preaching causing your trouble. You came here with it. And you'll leave with it if you don't repent. Hey, same with me. All I know, you, you can, do, and if I'm wrong, look it up and, and, and say he's wrong, forget it. Praise the Lord. I'm just simply saying people anymore don't even search the Scriptures to find the answer to their problems. The problem is in the Word of God. The solution is in the Word of God. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have our sins forgiven, to be right with God, have our prayers answered? No more guilt. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I've got a terrible past, and every now and then the devil just flash something on the screen and, and I'll get all down and I remember, hey, God doesn't remember it. I'm not going to remind him of it. The devil's a liar. I'm forgiven. Bless God. I'm not what I used to be. I'm sorry for the people that suffered and, and uh, from my sin in the past, but that's all behind me. I'm trying now to undo all of that and, and serve the Lord and be a blessing the rest of my life. But I'm not going to be drugged down by a past that's already buried at the cross of Calvary. No more guilt. Praise the Lord. Then he says he'll heal our land. Heal our land. And I think that's the focus of my concern right now. I can stand being sick a while. But can I stand for our country to be overrun by a bunch of ungodly terrorists? I've been in war, been after war, went to Guam, the island of Guam, 1948. I was 16 years old in the service. Went to Japan. Japan, you know, you think of them, the 
technology they have. Everybody's driving a Japanese car. I never would have thought that then. The old men my age, young men outside the base, they were sitting in a rickshaw. Two bicycle wheels on the back of a little cart and a little bicycle-like front. They pedaled. They sat out front of the base and all GIs like a taxi. That's how they made a living. They'd been defeated in war by a benevolent country. And they'd pedal us off to the beer joints and meet their daughters who were prostitutes for the American GIs to keep from starving to death. This was a benevolent victor who rebuilt their nation. But war, the ravages of war, I can't imagine it in America. I can't imagine us. Then here comes one with a bucket on his head, walking, you know, they could walk like this with a bucket on his head. I said, what is that? Well, he said, just wait till you get one, meet one on the street. They called them honey buckets, human manure that they were hauling out of their houses to fertilize their gardens so they could survive. I don't want that. My grandchildren don't deserve that. We've had a good life. We know the gospel. We ought to repent. And if, it, if we don't, it's because of selfishness. Just don't care, just don't believe. You say, well, God wouldn't do that, my God. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe your God is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible, now, you don't have to be a theologian. It doesn't take you a lot of research. Just read the first six chapters of Genesis. It'll take you about 20 minutes, and you'll see what kind of God you serve. A whole civilization was cast out of the Garden of Eden with hell to face because a woman ate an apple. And what's so bad about that? God just said, don't do it. That's rebellion, disobedience to God. That's the heart of all sin. And you can sit here and rationalize, well, God doesn't care what I wear. God doesn't care. Well, if God says it, you might ought to reevaluate whether he cares or not. God says things for a purpose, and we've seen all the fallout and the results of our disobedience, how it's affected our society, our families, our morals. I was sitting in a church uh, dinner the other night, had the civic auditorium there, and we were eating, and this fellow had his grandson, little grandson with him, and he said, uh, tell him about us taking you, tell Brother Riddick about us taking you over to Hooters. And uh, I said, you took your grandson to Hooters? He said, yeah. He said, they got good wings. I said, I didn't know the ad. Uh, I've never seen their ad on wings. He said, what do you mean? I said, uh, all I've seen them advertising brass and thighs. I didn't know they had wings. They don't ever put them on the billboard. I mean, we're the church family. This guy comes to church all the time. You know what I'm talking about? I think you've had too much positive preaching. Mm -hmm. Maybe we ought to just turn the burner up here and, you know. We don't have any conscience about anything anymore, it seems. I'm talking to church folks. Heal your land. Read about uh, Genesis 6. Get about Genesis 6. God destroyed the entire civilization because of their wickedness. You suppose they were more wicked than we? Then you go over to 19th chapter. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Not because of homosexuals there. Because there wasn't 10 righteous people there. Mm -hmm. 
We can do something about that. We can preach the gospel to a homosexual. He may or may not change, but it's not determined on whether he changes or not. It's us. Heal the land. <clears throat> Everywhere you read in the Bible, we're supposed to be a blessing. Where God's people went. Jacob went to his uncle Laban. He said, I'm going to leave. He said, I've been blessed for your sake. He said, you name your price because you, God's blessed me for your sake. Joseph, everywhere he went, the people were blessed, not because they were good. Listen, we owe it to our country. We owe it to our world to be a blessing. I think it would start today if we simply did as Jonah did. God told him to go to Nineveh. He went to Tarshish. He understood it. He didn't look for another version. He didn't go to the Greek or Hebrew. He knew he ought to go to Nineveh. Thank God he didn't go. I'm, he, I mean, thank God he, he admitted it, that he didn't go. He went to Tarshish. He was on the ship, and the storm came, and the mariners are praying to their gods. They're doing everything they could to try to survive. Finally, they went down. Where'd they find him? Asleep. He wasn't worried. I kind of think that's us. It, it, it bothers me how unconcerned I am. Does it you? And he, uh, then they said, uh, can you help us about analyzing what's the cause of this? Thank God he didn't lie. He said, it's for my sake this tempest come upon. They said, what's the answer? Get rid of me. Throw me overboard. I love Jonah. I believe here, he's here today. He'd repent or die. But he decided he'd rather die. I think we'd rather. I'm beginning to worry about that. I've seen people make choices, smoking, dope, whatever. They'll keep doing until they die. They know they're going to die. doctor tell them they're going to die. And they make a choice. Listen, it's frightening to think, but people would rather die than change. I believe if God judges this country, it'll be because of the church. I believe if he heals our country, it'll be because of the church. God help us this morning. I want the Holy Spirit of God to convict me, continue to work with me. I don't want to rest. I don't want to be in peace. I don't want to feel good about myself or anybody or anything until I'm willing to turn. I owe that to you. I owe it to my sons and daughters. I owe it to your sons and daughters. I owe it to my grandchildren. And most of all, I owe it to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. God bless you. Thank you.